This is all Appalachian, Southern Appalachian rainforest. It's the real deal. It's wild. So I grew up feral. I grew up in the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota. And it's some of my favorite memories and I'm free range again, I'm feral again. That's what I'm doing out here, you know? Why build it on a cliff? Why not? So, you know, in this digital frenzy where we're spun constantly, where everywhere you go, everybody's hunched over into their screen and they hardly know anything else exists. I want to push back. That's what this is all about. That's what, that's why this cabin's on a cliff here. It reminds me of Lord of the Rings. There's the lonely mountain. What initially happens is you come out, you're on a little gangway, almost like you're going to a castle. You get out on a cliff, and then all of a sudden you're out on a big cantilevered porch overlooking a valley that sees 80 miles, and it's wide open. All of a sudden everything just slows down. I hear the birds. I hear the bugs. The magic formula of what happens on this mountain, there's been something to interrupt that frenetic pace and all of a sudden you're willing to settle back and let the rhythm of the creation dictate how fast your heart's beating and how you're breathing and how your mind is flowing. My wife said this morning, it's wonderful to change gears. And I said, you know, the irony is for tens of thousands of generations, that's the only gear there was. That's how we lived. That's how people engaged it. So nobody want to toast? We're going to toast up here. So we're the unique beings out here a couple generations into the frenetic technology, computers, and, and, the, and the digital age, and our default position is spun out you know just like the matrix so i'm here i'm here to interrupt that the mountain is pretty much in charge okay. up here and and so this valley right here which is one of the bigger valleys in western north carolina mm -hmm. this is a funnel where all of the weather from the west comes through there like a freight train and we're on the front end of that train, so this thing gets hammered. You'll be in this thing, and the whole building will be just jerking a little bit because you're getting 80, 90 mile an hour gusts with sleet or snow or rain. This place here, I've got it anchored to the mountain, and the entire frame is oak. It's not pine, and everything's screwed, so this thing is rock solid well constructed. It's made to get hammered. It's bomb proof. Where is it? Where is the structure? Or is the structure just the rock? Oh, it's, it's all on rock pillars anchored to rock. They teach all the little kids in Sunday school. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. And then it says, ah, ah the foolish man builds his house on the sand. And it's pretty much the truth. You know, it is built on the rock. It's solid. Yeah, so you don't need much more structure besides the rock, or do you? How much do you need of- I tell you, no matter what I tell you, you're gonna worry. Just look at it. What can I tell you? It, yeah, it's crazy. It is, it's crazy. So what we see there, those rocks that look like a foundation, is that the foundation? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, and they're all pulled from right here. Okay. They were all scattered around in the top, so okay. I scrounged around up there with a wheelbarrow and a couple of guys that are 
stronger than they are smart. And we dragged that stuff together and, and cemented and anchored columns okay. and then got an oak timber frame and bolted it to those columns. That's what's holding this whole structure up. Oh, there we go. So what do you have, like six pillars down there? You just kind of... I have whatever was necessary. <laughs> you know, there's kind of only a few spots that lend themselves to it where you can anchor them. I don't look at a blueprint and go, all right, I'm coming out here and I'm going to carve this into the side of the mountain and I'm going to put this, this particular platform here. I pretty much come in and go, well, this column's going to sit here and it's not going to move. And there's a good spot for one over here. And when I'm done doing all of that and making sure it's level, then all of a sudden I know where my timbers are going. So it's pretty much the mountains in charge. And if I don't put the mountain in charge and I try to put a blueprint up here, it's blown off the mountain. You know what I mean? Yeah. It has to be tailor fit to the spot or it doesn't work. It's simple. I mean, it actually is floating. It's floating on rocks, but you know. It's anchored too. So it looks lighter than it is in a way, you know, like with this. Oh, this thing weighs a ton. These outside boards are not like the barns you normally see. They're white oak. They're hardwood. They're dense. This is where he started with these pillars first. Oh, really? Yeah. He built the pillar first. I grew up in northern Minnesota and we moved to Pennsylvania when I was 13 into suburbia. I was a fish out of water until all the building around me that was going on in suburbia I realized there was infinite potential for materials and we would ransack the building sites and drag it out into the woods and build stuff. The wall behind you, that just came from right here. Stonehenge, my shower thing over there. All those slabs came from, you know, just grabbed them out of the ground here and, and stuck them up. We're, we're building with the bones of the mountain here. It's granite. This is the foothills of the Great Smokies. We're on the Continental Divide. This is the backbone of the oldest mountain range on Earth. And it was the biggest mountains on Earth, but it's worn down to the bare bones. So you're seeing the bones of the biggest mountains on the planet right here. I'm, se I'm turning 71 in a week or two, and I've got 12 grandkids. And I look at the future, I look at them, I look at, my Lord, how different the world is that they live in from where I grew up, particularly starting in the Boundary Waters in Northern Minnesota. And I am gratified that somehow I stumbled into this spot. The history of the Front Range here, as far as native peoples went, this area was sacred and it was shared by all the lowland tribes, they would go down there to winter, hoe squash, corn, whatever. And then in the summer, all the tribes would come up here. And you can imagine it was like a festival. People who hadn't seen each other since the last season, distant relatives. And this was where they hunted. And the game is still abundant up here. They knew these spots. They knew how to come in here and build a fire and weather it out when the thunderstorms are roaring, roar, roaring through. I don't know what is it with humans and this sort of rock foundation that are cozy. Is that maybe just time and time back? Don't you think? The mountain does its thing lets people find a moment to take a breath and stumble toward their better self. Come up for air and say, wait a minute, what's my life about? What's it mean? Why am I here? Out of all the billions of people who have ever been born on this planet, why am I significant? And the mountain, if it does its thing, you end up up here being held in the arms of the universe like you're the last being on the planet and you're precious. That's what happens to everybody up here if they have that moment.
That's your shower. Stonehenge. I just said, let's find some big rocks and stack them around us. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And you know, that's straight out of the spring ice cold yeah. shower. There's no heat to it. So this is all your property. You have a huge, a huge lot of land. Like it was just being, uh, it, plots being sold at the time. It's, no, 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 no. There's, okay. there's no, nothing for sale up here. Okay. These have been in families for hundreds of years. Yeah. No, I just lucky. got lucky. Okay. Yeah. Jennifer found this piece of property. Mountain biking. It was okay. the middle of the wilderness. There's an old logging road that's overgrown now, but they rode up that. We were riding all these hills back then. Jenny came home and she said, I just found the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. And she took me here and I agreed with her. So I tracked down the owner. They used to own all of this since 1798. And I approached him and I said, you know, I promise you, I'm never gonna like develop it for residential or anything. This is, this is, I'm gonna get buried here. And I said, I'll take care of it. And he said, well, I kindly think I might sell, but not right now. And I would have that conversation with him every six months. And that went on for a decade. And one day he just said, well, I kindly think I'll sell it to you. Just like that, just as casual as could be. And that's where it came from. It was just a dream of my instincts from having grown up in the wilderness and everything else. I just resonated with it. It was the most beautiful spot. To be truthful, it's a little embarrassing that I'm so fueled by my adolescent rebirth to build a shack in the woods. That is high. <laughs> it is. How high again? Around 50 feet. And it was really fun to build. I drew a circle in my driveway, the diameter of the tree, and I just built my first set of steps around that circle, and then I reproduced it and built up the tree as I went. In spite of the fact it hasn't been the best and healthiest way and symbiotic way to, to build a tree house, but engineering-wise, there's some really cool stuff. For instance, all the trees are cabled together and connected so that they do move as a unit so there's not some kind of bucking or twisting and that one big timber has a arm for a caster wheel on a coal mining cart and it's just like a shopping cart caster that that it sits on and the whole entire treehouse pivots in the wind like this and moves smoothly so it is engineered. My nephew's an engineer, okay. and he came and saved me when I was in the middle of it. He said, Uncle Doug, you're going to kill somebody. Come on, I got to. And I was so grateful. I'll show you this arm. OK. And that pivots. It, it pivots on that arm, on that, that does this up there. So the whole treehouse does this instead of this. And that preserves all the framing and keeps it engineering intact. And you just climbed up? Yeah, it's what I do. It's a very scary climb, particularly if there's wind. Yeah, my kids expect me to die in a blaze of glory. It's deceiving because you feel really exposed. Here we are. And then when you get up, all of a sudden, you're not in a tree anymore. You're in a little hobbit hole. It's the coziest thing in the world. And it just shoots you out. Yep. Leaves you exposed to all the good stuff. You're in the canopy, really, or right at the top of it. Yeah, right at the top of it. You wouldn't want more exposure. It already gets enough wind. Does it? Okay. Yeah, if you got up above this tree line, I don't know. It'd be really scary. There's not a single building on the horizon for miles and miles and miles, which where do you go anymore 
Boston where you're this close to everything. I'm seven miles from the airport. There's nothing anywhere. You know, at night it's pitch black and you hear nothing but the wind and the trees and the animals. And you have your power right next to you, the solar? Yeah, it's similar to the cabin. It's got the same solar generator in it. It's a battery that is built specifically to interact with the solar panel out there. Part of my farm status here is that I have a sophisticated forestry plan that we're killing off invasive species that are harmful. And we're also select harvesting diseased trees and I use them for wood. We're trying to use wood at a rate where it replaces itself. Most people think wood stoves and the dampers on them where you open a wood stove up so that the air gets to the fire and the fire burns hot, you know, you, that's wide open. And then that damn thing runs like a space shuttle, burns up in about 15, 20 minutes and all the heat goes up the chimney. The way you do a wood stove is you get a good fire going, strong fire, and then you shut the dampers down and that thing will burn all night long and just smolder with a cauldron of coals and you're just warm as toast all night long. So half of it is outdoors. Oh yeah, people, there's an outdoor kitchen up here. It's made just a, a tree version of the cabin. It's very, it's a, the same energy, same kind of thing. Except you're way up here. This is Tree Walk Village. It's our little symbiotic menu. This is our Grand Central Station. <laughs> Because this connects all... Or the traffic circle, if you will. What was the Disney movie? Swiss Family Robinson. Yeah, we're, we're really kind of trying to harness the Swiss Family Robinson energy out here. So you're just working around the trees. Absolutely. You have to ask for their permission before you put a hole in them. What are you using, just cable? So yeah, this is a nice thick cable for our suspension bridges. Okay. And they, but they don't hold the tree house. Okay. The tree house is only held by these those two metal tabs coming out of the tree there. And so, yeah, we just kind of rub the sweet spot and then poke a hole in it. That's not a Garnier, is it? Yes. There's also a lot of, Eric and I have put our heads together and a lot of the substructure in here, I was a pipe fitter journeyman welder, so I'm, I'm good at metallurgy. And Eric and I engineered some very specific bracing that ties back into, how do you call it? The Garnier? Garnier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're doing stuff here that's never been done before. When Eric talks about the sweet spots, he's talking about the same thing as my rock pillars on the cliff cabin. It's not a spot that we pick with a blueprint or, or we survey. We look at the specific tree and there is a spot that is the best leverage point that is gonna suspend a platform in the perfect position where it's balanced on that tree. The reason that this platform right here, the structure that you see, this outline right here, is the footprint of the treehouse that's going to sit right here. The reason it's sitting on this side of the tree here, the main weight, is because if you look at this tree, it grows out into the ravine. So its center of gravity is leaning into this space to get sunlight and open air. And so we're helping it. We're counterbalancing its reach into the ravine for sunlight and life. And we're the counterbalance now. So we're making an agreement and we're saying, you know what? We're not here to just perch something up in you. We wanna do it in such a way that we work together and it actually leverages you towards health. Now all these trees are cabled together and they move symbiotic. So when the wind sways, they, they move, all they all start to move together because of the cable system that's holding it all together. So it's become a real interaction between the jungle and us and the wind and the elements. And it's been really unique. 
You know how Swiss Family Robinson was this kind of Robinson Crusoe story of a family who builds a really cool tree? And then Star Wars comes along and they do Ewok Village where it's not just Swiss Family Robinson, it's this cool little culture of these incredible cool creatures that lives in the trees in harmony with them all interconnected. We're not Ewok Village, we're Tree Walk Village. And we're doing a symbiotic Swiss Family Robinson where, yes, we're trying to connect people just like we connected these trees. Hey, you gotta look inside this first. So this is the first house. Yeah, and, and we started framing this about a week ago. Oh, wow, really? So that's how fast it goes. And just traditional frame? Uh, yeah, we're doing a lot of traditional framing, but we are introducing post and beam. So we're doing some big visible post and beams that will be exposed. We're staying with the same theme of the expansion of the mountain. So, I mean, this treehouse has 16 foot ceilings in it. You know, the, the doors are eight feet. And we love to go, Doug especially loves to go find old antique doors and windows and salvage yards and find really unique pieces of architecture to incorporate into the structure. This will have a loft in it with stairs. So we're gonna do full set of stairs up to the loft. And then actually we'll put a, another door up here out onto a widow's deck because we're not high enough yet. We need to get people even higher. Keep up and up and up. It's got the bones of a castle in a tree. And, and you know, you can look out the window and see we have to build scaffolding. We have to have somewhere to stand to work. Oh, oh, not much. <laughs> That's your scaffolding. That's our scaffolding. One board. After yeah. hanging in thin air for weeks, it feels like it feels like pretty good footing. You're a climber. You guys, climber. Yeah, you have to skydiver. Yep, got to be comfortable with space. Here's your hardware. It's the metal stud into the tree, but we have a support bracket. This is a huge house, and the girders in here, these LVLs, these laminate beams, can support the weight of a fool like him easily. <laughs> That's the whole structure then. I mean, the whole support mm -hmm. for the structure. We also put some legs on this one out of locust okay, posts that support. stabilize. Stabilized you know, it's one of those things we did in agreement with the trees where we've added a lot of weight. These trees are getting a little help. It's kind of like the old people when you see them out hiking with their walking poles. They're just supporting themselves. That one there is our purest platform as far as very simple, straightforward, traditional treehouse structure that you're probably going to see out in the field quite often, although we're way higher than most people. Yeah. Most people don't want to dangle up there and, and, and do that. Okay. Most treehouses can be built with a, a ladder, but they don't make ladders that go up to that one. We fabricated these metal brackets and, and created that just out of thin air. This is our biggest tree we've built in. It's over 100 years old and it's really healthy. This is all off of the property as well. This is locust. Locust is so hard, the wood is so hard that the sawyers at the sawmills won't cut it. It ruins their saws. Some of them will, but they don't like to. And the old timers would not burn locust in their stoves because it burns almost as hot as coal and it'll melt your stove if it's not built to take that high heat. So we get all this off the property and it's almost like ivory. It's not like wood, it's like prehistoric. It is so strong and so hard and so gnarly and for the most part in the mountains here, it's been considered a weed, but I have tons of it grown all over the mountains 
And as you can see, we like using it. All of our posts, everything here is locust, and that will outlast everything else we've built on the mountain. That will still be here when this is rubble. This is the Divide Cottage, and the Eastern Continental yeah. Divide runs through the center of the bed. You can see there's a flow to everything. There's curves, there's lines. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found out earlier in life, my generation, we used to take the Iowa tests. And the Iowa tests were what the CIA came up with to do battle against the Soviet intelligentsia of trolling their, you know, of surveying all of their citizens to try and find the smartest, most talented people, because it was a contest. And I was almost autistic. I was almost Rain Man. But where I excelled was whenever they did geometric shapes, they would do three-dimensional geometric shapes. And they would show you two sides or three sides, and then they'd show you an array of pieces, which one fits into this. And I had the highest score they'd ever done. And so I was getting Ds and Fs in school, and I was off the scale. So I was always in trouble because I wasn't applying myself. I was doing the best I could. I love it, but you could get geometry. You get the shapes, right? I see spatial. That's why I can see a rock a quarter of a mile away and know it's going to fit right there within inches. And it's just an instinct. And the other thing I have that uh, is a carryover from growing up in the boundary waters where it's just a maze of waterways is I have a built-in GPS so that when I'm roaming all of these mountains, I always know where I am in the big picture. I, I, I'm, I know where I am relative to this draw, that draw, that ravine, that rock face. I always know where I'm at. You'll get an idea of the kind of rocks that are available here by what we have going on here. Stone hedge type rocks. It's all granite, mostly granite. This is hard, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is where the divide is. Yeah, the, that's the Gulf. Okay. And that's the Atlantic. This straddles, this building straddles. Everything that falls away there goes to the Atlantic. Everything that falls away here goes to the Gulf. This is the center point. We're perched. That's why it's called the Divide Cottage. The backbone is running right through the bed. Love it, love it. It's great. I mean, all the glass is amazing on this one. Yeah, I get all this stuff at the thrift stores. Those are Anderson windows. My nephew who builds, he's still building McMansions. He's building, you know, $5 million houses. I showed him my stash. He goes, you got $5,000 in windows for 300 bucks. I said, pretty good. Like even this door right here, that's a couple grand for a door like that. This little refrigerator, some fool didn't pay attention, did not listen to me, left food in the refrigerator, and what do you think that is? That's where the bear bit the door and opened my refrigerator. You can see the other teeth mark over on the edge here. It just, it's like there's something in there I want. Oh, and a tin shower. It's all off grid. Plumb to the spring or how does the water come in? Yeah, it's gravity. All the water here is gravity fed. This is my water storage tank. It stores 1500 gallons of water. It pumps up from a spring with a forest service pump for fire. It's got a Honda motor on it with an electric start. It pumps 70 gallons a minute. This rock all came from the property here. I pick these out. I go into the woods and I say, I want that one, that one, that one, that one. And then if you look, it starts with the biggest one and they gradually shrink as they go up and all of the rocks start huge and then shrink and curve up to the last one. And it's all geometric. That's a lot of rock moving. I mean, look at all this. This just feels like huge endeavor. It takes these 71 year old guns right there. <laughs> Bo
But one thing I liked on this, and, and it was my goal, is because I put these gigantic rocks in there that weigh twice as much as your SUV, yeah. I didn't want the support system for my deck to be poaching on these magnificent rocks. So I floated the deck. It's floating, there's almost no support. But it's all done with metal. Girders and metal yeah. bracing, you can see the underside of it. It's very heavy duty. Wow. And it's anchored into a, a concrete floor. Okay. And that set of steps is a 1940s fire escape off an old apartment building in Asheville. So I, I would stand these rocks up and build all this stuff around them. Yeah, someday, I hope after I'm gone, there'll be one of these crazy conspiracy theorists who think the aliens build it. Moving rocks like that and making them line up, I set every one of those by hand with my tractor and a, and a winch. And some of them are 500, 800 pounds. Just the hearth is one piece. That's like 12,000 pounds, just the hearth. You know, there's way easier ways to cash in on this place. And the investors that have tried to buy it from me have made sure that I know how foolish I am. You don't do rock work like that to make money. You don't do this to cash in. You cash in to do this. It's the opposite way I live most of my life, trying to make a living, you know, raising four kids, having 12 grandkids, trying to pay the bills. I love this book called A Touch of Wonder. I don't think it's in print anymore. Teach me the kindness and the gentleness of those who fight against the anger of this world, the beauty hidden in the smallest of things, the mystery, the wonder of it all. I like the red ones too, though. Yeah, one of our meditations is to not let the mundane cover up the wonder. One of Jenny's sayings, and I don't know where she got it, but she, it's on our refrigerator. It says, polish the mundane. So I guess that's the secondary motto, polish the mundane. Because what your daily life can sort of get, you feel you start to complain or you start to forget to notice things. I mean, what happens normally? You just get on autopilot. You know, got to put wood in the treehouse, got to do this, got to do that. But I will say this, the mountain never leaves you alone. There'll be moments when I'm having to put wood up here and I'm going, ah, oh, damn, I don't want to go up those steps. And there'll be 80 mile an hour gusts. It'll be 10 degrees outside. And I'll be carrying it up there and bouncing off the truck of the tree from the wind. And I'll just start laughing out loud. This is crazy. This is awesome. This is, you know. So, yeah, the mountain, the mountain is never mundane. We're the ones that get mundane, you know what I mean? And we got to wake up. The mountain always delivers. 